Okay, great. Well, if no one else has any lab business, I'll hand it over to Ariel to give his presentation. All right, let me pull up the screen. Okay, uh, tell me when you guys can see the screen and I will get started. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. So yeah, I wanted to talk today about this paper um, on uh, essentially trying to understand the representational space of natural objects um, through online subjective similarity experiments, because it's pretty relevant to the kind of experiments that we run in the lab. Uh, and it's by uh, Martin Hebert and colleagues from the uh, NIH or NIMH. Um, so uh, let's, let's see what they did. Uh, now, before I get too into it, I want to make clear that I, I'm much more interested in this because of the methods than because of the results, because the methods are quite applicable to the lab. Um, so if you came or you're watching this on YouTube later and you're interested in the results more than the methods, then you're watching the wrong talk and you should probably go do something else. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the background to begin with. So the idea is that we want to have some way of like being able to understand and characterize the relationships between, and I use the scare quotes here, psychological objects. So for the paper, they're going to talk about objects as these like natural stimuli. So like a tree, a car, a boat, uh, a pie, like any sort of visual object. Um, and they want to measure the similarity between those, but they don't specify whether they mean um, like the thing in and of itself or the thing as a visual stimulus or the experience because they don't care about the philosophy like we do. Um, they're just talking about these like visual objects. But you can also think about the same thing in terms of like, you might wanna do the same thing with uh, like concepts. So you could do this with semantics rather than visual objects. Um, or you could think about it in the same sense that we do normally, which is in the sense of qualia. So like where we really do care about the experiences. But it doesn't matter which kind of psychological object we're talking about. The idea is that they want to be able to um, characterize the relationships between these objects. Um, and the way in which they do it and we do it um, is we collect similarity judgments between the individual objects. So we try and use that as some sort of distance measure. Um, so you can see here, like an example using colors is maybe somehow if you measure the similarity between all the colors, you'll be able to form some model of like color space or do some sort of dimensionality reduction to understand the relationships between all those colors. Now, there's a pre-existing set of well-developed tools for doing that, of which multidimensional scaling, we've heard about lots in the lab and that's the most prominent one. Um, but there's an issue, which is that to do multidimensional scaling, you need to have like every single possible similarity relationship between your set of psychological objects specified. Um, and that's very difficult to scale up to large object sets. Um, and uh, that's that solving that problem is essentially the reason why I was interested in this paper in the first place, because they present one potential way with dealing with that issue. Um, I should also say ahead of time, feel free to ask questions during the talk. I'm quite happy for this to be interactive. Okay, so um, I'll get into the practical constraints a little more clearly before we get to how they deal with them in the paper. So I'm talking about similarity judgments between psychological objects, so experience or stimuli or concepts or whatever they are. Um, but there's quite a few different ways that you can actually try and obtain like a subjective similarity judgment. Um, so possibly the, the simplest one is when you're comparing, let's say like A and B. So a tree to a car or red to green or two items. And you just directly ask the participants, like, how similar are the two of these? And you try and get them to give you some sort of numerical value that you can then plug in. Um, now, that's useful in that it's very simple and it's direct. It's problematic in that it's very notoriously difficult for participants to provide consistent numerical values. So there's anchoring effects, there's framing effects, there's like what's a consistent range, all those sorts of issues. Um, so one way of asking for similarity judgments that's a bit different is to ask for like odd one out judgments. So instead of just asking directly for uh, how similar are these two objects, you present three objects. So let's say a car, a motorbike, and a tree, and you ask um, which of these is the odd one out, which is equivalent to asking 
uh, which of them, in, which two objects are most similar to each other and obtaining one value of dissimilarity again. Um, except instead of asking it in a continuous sense, you're just getting like a rank order between these objects. Um, so that's another way that's like totally doesn't constrain participant choices um, that you can use to get these similarity judgments. Um, and then the issue with both of these, though, is that they're not very efficient. Um, so if you have uh, now, now, oh, so I think now has a question. Yeah, yeah. I, are you, have you found any kind of empirical study that looked at the uh, difficulty of this odd one out task? when uh, three of them are all similar or three of them are all dissimilar. You know, one, if, you know, obviously, let's say, you know, G is very different, then, you know, it should be extremely easy. I, I, I understand, but uh, if three things are really similar, it's very difficult to do. And also potentially, if it's also really different, it's very difficult to do, right? Yeah, so that, that's another practical constraint. I haven't looked at a specific study, although I suspect that maybe one of the Shepard or Tversky papers from the 70s or 80s might have it in it. Um, normally, the way that's, that's dealt with is you would run this experiment over like a large number of different subjects, and you'd look at like the probability of item selection. Um, mm. And if you saw that like, well, each of them had a roughly equal chance of being selected as um, the odd one out, uh, then you would assign that as like, well, they're all very similar to each other or very different from each other, essentially. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't seen a, a specific study that touches directly on that problem. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it might exist. Um, so there are ways, the, sorry, just to clarify. So there's pairwise comparisons. On a oh, three sorry, we have a, another question from Chuen. Uh, so sorry for interruption, Ariel. So there, I just want to ask, so there is no degree or no ratings of this similarity or distance among the three objects? Uh, not in this study and not in a traditional odd one out judgment. So you just, I'll, I'll show, I mean, I'll skip ahead a slide so you can see an example, but it, it oh, might okay. be something like this at the top right, where you're just like, you show a pretzel, a floor mat and a koala, and you ask which one is the odd one out. And this, I suppose, is also a good example for now because it's totally not obvious to me which one is the odd one out here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. we'll get to that again in a minute. Yeah. But well, that's how the task... Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, just um, for, for the curiosity, who thinks which one is the most odd one? Can you type uh, the response in chat box? I can't see the responses. So someone just tell me when they're there. People are saying um, we've got doormat and koala. Most people are saying doormat and now and Yanshin said koala. Okay. I wonder oh, yeah. whether there's this there's this anchoring effect because I didn't have uh, had lunch not too long ago. So it's uh, <laughs> the pretzel oh, looks oh. Uh, pretty good. Oh. All right. But yeah, so, so that we'll, we'll get to how they deal with that in a minute. Um, the point I just wanted to make here before we move on is the pairwise comparisons, you need N squared um, comparisons for N stimuli at a minimum. So it increases quadratically. Um, the triads are even worse. You need N cubed because you are essentially doing pairwise comparisons, but then also with every other possible third object. Um, uh, and so there are other ways which try and get around this and try and get more similarity judgments at essentially in the same trial. Um, so for example, Krieger Scorte and his lab have come up with some clever methods where you like get participants to spatially arrange your set of objects and then the spatial arrangement that they produce um, represents the similarities between them. Um, but then that has some issues in that you're constraining objects to only be able to be similar within this two dimensional space. And the issue is that if the judgments, like if the space of the objects is actually much higher dimensionality than that, you're not gonna be able to capture that with only two dimensional judgments. So essentially you have this trade-off between uh, less efficient methods, but which are less constrained or more efficient methods, which are more constrained. Um, and that's the point I wanted to make. Um, and the point that Hibat and I would also make is that one of the benefits of this triad thing 
um, is that you get some contextual effects. So you can look and see how like different contexts change the similarity judgments, which you don't get with pairwise comparisons. So this isn't an exhaustive view of like all the different ways you can do similarity judgments, but it's just to note that there's actually a lot of different ways you can ask participants for how similar things are. And there's quite a few different um, uh, theoretical and empirical difficulties in asking the question. So onto the specific study, um, they chose uh, items from this things database, um, which I haven't looked into in detail, but I assume is just a validated set of images that are all relatively easy for people to name. Um, so there aren't weird objects in it. They're all common objects um, that people can identify. And they chose almost 2000 objects from it. They used that odd one out paradigm that I was just talking about. Um, and they were very happy with the fact that they used the third object because they thought that using it to serve as a context was important and that by repeatedly sampling a pair of objects with a different third object, um, you would get a better sense of um, the actual relationships between items. Um, I guess now that that might be what they would say in response to your earlier question about like what if you have three items that are really different from each other or really similar to each other. They'd say that like, well, maybe by like having different sets of what those three items are in those particular trials, you might have problems. Um, but if you've got trials where that third object is varied systematically, you'll get a better sense of um, whether the other two items are actually very similar or very different from each other um, through the, the change in context. Um, where was I? Yes. So the point, though, is with uh, almost 2,000 objects, so 18, uh, 1,854 objects, um, if you're doing these triad odd one out judgments, um, there's about a billion possible combinations, uh, and they did not have the money to spend on Mechanical Turk to ask participants for a billion different combinations at least. Um, so instead, what they did is they very sparsely samples uh, the set of possible combinations. So they only got 0.14% of those, um, which still amounted to 1.46 million trials um, spread across almost 6,000 participants. Um, so that's uh, a bit bigger than most of the experiments we've done in the lab. I think we've probably done a tenth of that as our biggest experiment, um, but it just shows that you can scale these things up. Um, so let's let's see what they did specifically. Um, is everyone still with me before I start talking about the model? All right, cool. Um, so what they did essentially is they took each one of these objects and they wanted to model the similarity between these objects. Um, so they assigned each one of these objects a row um, and then they initialized a model which had 90 different dimensions. Um, so they ended up with a matrix that was 1854 uh, rows, so one row for each item, uh, and then 90 dimensions, so one column for each dimension. Uh, and then to begin with, they just randomly initialized some weights between the objects. Um, so they're starting off assuming nothing about how the objects are related to each other. Um, they just like set random values to um, see the relationships. Um, oh, yeah. Ariel, now just, yeah. Uh, yeah, how, how did they choose this number, 90? Uh, I think they just wanted to choose a big number. So they also tried later on, uh, or within the paper, they tried it with 200 at one point. Um, and they said that it didn't much matter if they started with 90 or if they started with 200. Um, my guess is for some sort of computational reason. Um, but they don't make clear why they started with 90. Um, okay. Maybe also on some a priori grounds that they didn't think that there would be more than 90 dimensions, but yeah, it's not clear where they pulled 90 from. Mm -hmm. um, so they, yeah, so we have this matrix and this essentially serves as the, um, like the model that they are trying to improve on. So uh, they start with this and what they wanna do is they wanna adjust the values in these dimensions um, such that uh, the objects or the rows um, that are more similar each other to each other according to subjective subjective judgments um, are more similar to each other numerically. 
Uh, and when I say similar, what they counted as similar was the dot product between these different rows. So they're trying to adjust these rows such that um, similar items uh, have a higher dot product with each other and less similar items have a uh, less, like a lower dot product with each other. Um, but they also, and we can talk about this later, explore other metrics like using the Euclidean distance um, between the rows as well. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to uh, go through these sets of similarity judgments, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then once they've updated this model a bunch, um, they're going to remove all of the dimensions that have like low weighting for the objects. And then they're going to see if they can try and predict similarity judgments using a like smaller set of dimensions. Um, so essentially what they're going to try and do is they're going to um, update this matrix uh, and then they're going to use it to generate this representational dissimilarity matrix between all the objects. Um, I might skip to the next slide because it will probably make more sense when I talk through their process and then we can come back to this one if need be. Um, so specifically what they do is let's say we start with this initialized random uh, model um, and then through like their each one of their 1.4 million trials um, picks out three of the rows. So they extract the vector representation for that object triplet. So in this circumstance, the, uh, the pretzel, the floor mat, and the koala. Um, and then they compute the proximity for each pair. So they compute the similarity for each pair, um, which they use using the dot product, um, which is essentially each one of the dimensions, uh, the value for that item multiplied um, with itself. For each item so they do that for systematically across the triads and then they see which one of these objects has the biggest um, uh, dot product um, and then after um, putting that dot product through this um, uh, softmax function they use that to choose the odd one out uh, which makes me realize actually i think I, I said it the wrong way around before so the the item with the largest dot product they assume is the odd one out, not actually the most similar one. Um, and then they see whether they got it right. So in this circumstance with the initial weights, the item that was predicted to be the odd one out was the pretzel, uh, whereas the humans apparently chose the koala. So I guess whoever said koala before was correct. Um, uh, and then they back propagate the error to update the weights across those dimensions. Uh, we just have yeah. a question from Edgen. Um, it's it's probably a little late to ask these questions, but by object dimensions, do you mean like the color, shape, visual features, or something of that sort? No, and you, that, you a, sorry, I should let you finish your question before I start answering it. Please, yeah. please finish. <laughs> uh, it, it's fine. Um, so in each of these rows, right, it represents a value of a dimension. The, a, a given dimension, and you get the dot product of two um, objects, which is to kind of get an overall visual similarity or something between the two objects, and then you use that to predict whether it can to predict the behavioral results, something like that, right? Yeah, that's that's actually an excellent question, uh, and you flagged that I've probably done a bad job of explaining uh, the model. So let me jump back a second. Um, so with the model, it's as you say. So each one of the rows is an object, and each one of the columns, uh, which they initially start with ninety columns, is a dimension. Um, and to begin with, those dimensions don't mean anything except that they are values that can possibly be filled. Um, and they can take certain values. Um, but to begin with, the, the dimensions are completely like uninterpretable. They, they don't mean anything at the start beyond um, those values can change. Um, and by adjusting those weights, you can improve the performance of the model at selecting which object is the odd one out. What they are hoping for is once they run the, the model through all 1.46 million trials, uh, and they finish the um, back propagation to get this model as 
to as good a performance as they can is that they'll be able to inspect these dimensions, the, the, um, the columns, and that they will be interpretable. So uh, items that have high values will all have some feature that we can recognize as some actual like human understandable feature and items that have low values will have the opposite end of that. So you can imagine that like maybe the first column corresponds to uh, like animate. So things that can move have high values and things that can not move have low values is what they're hoping to find at the end. Does that make sense? Yes, so basically it, this is to ask the algorithm to pick up the most essential features that are relevant to this similarity ratings. Yeah, that's right. So they're giving it the chance to find 90 possible dimensions that humans use um, to make similarity judgments. Um, but they're also gonna see if maybe we actually use far fewer dimensions than that um, to make similarity judgments. Um, and the idea is they're hoping that these dimensions will be interpretable when they're finished with the procedure. Okay. Yeah, I maybe, had... Maybe I, I, okay, um, go ahead. Yeah, I had that question actually, and maybe it's better to ask at the end, if they, the dimensions they have at the end, are they able to understand what each dimension corresponds to? Uh, that is definitely part of the results, so we'll just get to that as we come. Okay, but, but before going there, uh, I, I I thought that, that that's actually a great uh, point uh, to uh, discuss. So just two things. One is that uh, uh, in, in some, what Kenshin asked was whether this algorithm is in a sense top down, like a researcher or, uh, you know, driven kind of a chosen particular feature, conceptual feature mapping onto or, you know, assigning some value by human scorer. Right, that's the sort of top-down kind of approach, and this one is a bottom-up approach. Like based on the data, you try to find some kind of feature. So that's the difference, and then that also maps onto some paper that the Nirmiti or Aniko uh, presented, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. If you remember, there was a uh, lots of emotion uh, movies, and um, you know that's a uh, twin and also uh, uh, currently Phil is uh, using as well. And that movie's analysis, you know, they use this, you know, top-down kind of emotion approach, right? So they initially, you know, assigned many different kind of features, like you know, um, agitation or anger or fear and so on, and the people just rated that. So that's a complete, in a sense, complementary kind of approach, bottom-up versus top-down. That's one point. And the second point is that uh, the dimension here is assumed to be uh, orthogonal, right? Or independent with uh, this metric, I think, with this me me metric. If it's dot products yeah. um, and back propagation, yeah, I think that's correct, but don't- I think it, to it. Try, yeah, it tries to probably find the uh, you know, dimension that is more as independent or at least less, you know, are redundant, I think. But yeah. uh, whether the human conceptual space or conceptual feature or conceptual dimensions are something that is independent or orthogonal is highly, pro you know, unclear, right? Like, you know, yeah. we might have some kind of animate dimension, which is also potentially correlated with some kind of movable or not. But it's also separate kind of a dimension, right? So yeah. this, you know, dependence or, you know, orthogonality of the dimension is extremely important and a very complicated uh, question, but this one is imposing orthogonality. So yeah. that's the sort that's of the advantage that the top-down approach can potentially take care of. Yeah, that, that's correct. We'll see in their results how well the model does though and whether that argues for whether it does um, accurately sort of uh, capture what human object similarity representations are. Um, the one other point I wanted to make as well that I remembered is this is a bottom-up approach, but I, I think, and don't hold me to it because I'm not a machine learning researcher, um, but I think this ends up being very similar to um, essentially like a supervised learning um, training um, program, where they're trying to train this model and they're correcting it each time um, to get better and better at predicting these odd one out judgments. 
All right. Um, we also just have one minute before the break, so. Uh, this might be a good point to break then for five minutes. And then we'll okay, all right. Break. We'll have the five minute break now. Beth, can you stop recording so that it's easier for us to edit? All right, welcome back. Um, yeah, so the point I wanted to make at this stage, now that we have a better understanding of the modeling procedure that Ibat et al are using, um, is that there are some assumptions of this procedure. Um, so they, they call it a, a representational embedding. Um, and the idea is that they think they're gonna be able to find this model, which generates the um, similarity judgments that participants will make. Um, but the use of uh, this particular representational embedding with these particular um, metrics to define their similar similarity judgments. So either using the dot product or Euclidean distance between um, these uh, vectors along these dimensions um, is essentially assuming that the similarity of these objects can be represented by an inner product space or uh, more typically a, a vector space, which makes these metric space assumptions, which we've talked about many times in the lab as to whether they are actually valid or not for reflecting human psychological, um, uh, the, <laughs> The, the terminology matters here, so I don't want to mess it up, but whether whether or not these are appropriate or not. Um, and to their credit, he and I'll point out the potential difficulties with these assumptions. Um, so they talk about the work of Tversky, for example, who showed that um, maybe we shouldn't be using these kinds of uh, uh, modeling assumptions and that maybe other things like feature-based representations, um, so non-geometric representations might be more appropriate. Um, but there's also others who've argued for other ways of sort of modeling these kinds of data. Um, so either it's using alternative metrics, so not using these dot products and Euclidean distances, but using like a kernel metric or portal metrics, um, or it's using other sorts of tools entirely. Um, the other point I wanted to talk about as well is uh, now's question before about like, well, they use 90 dimensions, is 90 dimensions appropriate? Um, it is like key to consider here that um, this modeling procedure would fail if it turned out that humans actually do use more than 90 dimensions um, for all the different kinds of objects that they are trying to model here. Um, so there, there are a number of assumptions that go into this procedure um, that have to be kept in mind. And it's not clear whether they apply um, to whether these are valid assumptions for the particular objects that are being modeled here. Um, and it's also not clear whether it would be appropriate for other sorts of psychological objects. So maybe they, it's totally fine here, but it wouldn't work for um, if we were looking at concept similarity or it wouldn't work if we were looking at lower level like similarities between colors or sounds or all sorts of things like that. Um, and very often it's just assumed that you can just always model things with these vector spaces, but that might not be the case. Um, we have a question? question. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, they try to, did they... I, I can't hear you. I could hear you at the start, but your audio seems to have cut out. Is this Fine, better? Gotta... Yeah, that's better. Uh, did, 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 did they use noisy reduction method like, like uh, PCA or Gizme, whatever? Uh, sorry, I can't. I could hear the first part. I think you're asking, did they use a dimensionality reduction method like PCA yeah. or something? Um, they, they do use a dimensionality reduction method, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but okay. it's not PCA. Great. Um, Anything else before I go on? We're all good? Okay. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I'll actually answer um, Isaac's question. So instead of using a dimensionality reduction method, they actually did a, a much simpler tool. 
which is so they initially started with these tiny different dimensions um, and they examined the like weights that were given to all of the objects um, once they had finished the um, the learning procedure uh, and then they actually just eliminated a whole bunch of dimensions that didn't seem to have very high weights at all for any of the objects um, so they were of the 90 dimensions almost half of them were un, like basically set to almost zero by the end of the procedure and then they just dumped those and they kept all of the remaining dimensions that had weights for all objects above 0 0.1 um, and then what they wanted to do was they wanted to examine the dimensions that remained and see if they were human interpretable along the lines of Chanchin's question before does that make sense Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, before we look at whether the dimensions are actually interpretable or not, um, I'll just demonstrate uh, what they actually found when they tried to validate whether their model was working properly or not. Um, so obviously they couldn't directly check the full model to see whether it correctly generated all the predictions because they would need a billion different um, uh like real values in order to do that um but what they ended up doing was they took a, a subset of the objects 48 objects and they ran another online experiment where they did exhaustively sample all of the similarity relationships between those objects um and they also checked for inter-participant agreement on objects um similarities generally um so they found typically that the noise ceiling was about uh in the high 60%, so let's say like 68% or so. Um, so that was the agreement level um, between participants, uh, where a chance level would be 33%. Um, and then they saw how well the model did, uh, keeping that in mind. Um, so you can see here. Uh, that but now it just has a, has a question. Yeah, so the, did you understand what this noise ceiling thing is? I remember when I read the paper, this was a bit unclear. I mean, how they computed it and whether this is actually really, you know, uh, clear or defensible. Yeah, I, so maybe I just assumed that I understood, but I'm not sure I actually did now that you asked about it more. My, I, I thought what they did is they just, they took the triads of uh, possible judgments across these 48 objects. Um, and they just like looked at the, um, the intersubjective agreement. I, I can't remember whether this is, the value that they then used as the noise ceiling is like the main level of agreement between participants or whether it's some other more complicated measure. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I don't think yeah, so I, for example, you know, what I can imagine is that let's say in the case of the quarter thing, right? Quarter triplet, at least yeah. among us, you know, among 15 of us, probably like four or five people said the koala and then nine or eight said uh, floor mark. So, that would be like, you know, as a sort of intersubject of agreement, a, a choosing format would be like, let's say 70%. And then the rest is 30%. And so in that case, uh, if the model chooses format, then uh, the maximum accuracy that they can get is like 70%, right? But if yeah. they focus only on something extremely obvious, like a you know, format and the koala and also kangaroo, and then from much should be the always the case. Then, you know, there can be uh, that the uh, prediction can be actually as high as hundred, right? Because uh, in a human, everybody agrees with that, and their model should also predict that. So you know that that kind of you know uh, fluctuation can happen for each of the uh, tri triads, and also. Another issue I can imagine is that the, depending on the individuals, like, you know, if you ask me that triad hundred times, for example, I might say koala every time, right? So in that case, model should be able to predict the, the koala thing for me, hundred percent time. Yeah. 
So, but, but anyway, you know, for the second part, you said that it is basically the prediction about population, right? And yeah, so the noise ceiling is based on the population. Okay. But not yeah. possibly dependent on the specific triad. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to check again. I think it's the main across all of the triads rather than okay. based on any specific triad. Um, and yeah, they, they aggregated all of the judgments together. So as far as I'm aware, they cleaned some of the participants out. So if they always just chose like the same location on the screen every single time, um, or if they responded way too fast, they got rid of them. Uh, but then I think they just dumped all the similarity judgments together afterwards. Um, or okay. at least if they did more processing than that, they didn't make it clear. Yeah. Um, the point just being their model ends up fitting quite well. Um, so you can see here, it's got an R of 0.9 um, and the representational matrices look pretty similar. Um, so for this 48 object matrix, um, it seems to be performing very well. Um, that's all. And now we, now we can have a look at the results and see if they actually make sense. So uh, the actual results. So we were asking about whether we could interpret the dimensions. Um, and what they did was they essentially started by uh, the researchers themselves inspecting what kind of objects went to either end of those dimensions. So which objects had high values and which objects had low values. Um, for example, one way of plotting this was with these um, t-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding um, of the similarity matrix that they got at the end. Um, another way they did it is they actually just showed participants um, like samples of the objects from each end of the dimensions and then asked them if they could write down the name of the dimensions. Um, and basically every single dimension that they ended up looking at was interpretable. So you can see some examples here that uh, there was like an animal related dimension or an insects dimension or a colorful dimension um, or basically they, they could easily find names for all of the different dimensions um, that were left at the end of the procedure. Um, I'm also a little curious just to check my understanding with everyone else. So I, I haven't tried to implement um, these T distributed SNEs before. Um, so if other people have, I'd be curious, but I think the way this works is they take the similarity matrix. Um, so the like 18, almost 2000 by 2000 matrix. Um, they initially perform multidimensional scaling on it uh, assuming that there will be, in this circumstance, two dimensions. Um, so they like essentially project that matrix down onto two dimensions. Um, and then they try and like hold on to the um, similarity clusters in the higher dimensional space um, by just like distributing objects kind of with a T distribution around clusters of similarity. Um, and that's how they get this representation of the similarity between all of these different objects and how they're able to show off these clusters with these different dimensions. Um, but I, I'm curious if anyone else understands ts &E a little bit better. Is that how this works? If you know, that was my take from a, a quick Wikipedia examination. Um, Chanchen has a question. Yes, so um, I might miss something, but my understanding of the figure on the right is that, um, the similarity is kind of spatially organized. So if two objects are spatially close to each other, then they are similar to each other in a way. And second is their similarity is also represented by the color, which the color uh, and the color represents a certain dimensions. That's all correct, yes. Oh, okay. Mm. So if two colors are away from each other, that means the dimensions are, I don't know. Yeah, I think, so the colors represent the dimensions. So if it's got like a big green, like in the top, then that's like an animal. Um, uh, whereas if it's got this big blue over here, that's sort of like a tool. Um, and then the, like distance between the objects 
uh, is like the difference between those, um, I guess, dimensions to a certain degree. Although maybe I've misunderstood because the dimensions are supposed to be orthogonal. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah, and I, I any, might not fully grasp it. Yeah, and any any rationale behind their choice of colors? Because it's I don't fully understand. Because there are the the right hand side is mostly blue, purplish, but then on the left hand side you can also see like small patches of blue. That's kind of a sign to the fish. So I am not really sure what dimension blue really represents. Um, the, I think they're using the same color scheme here for the individual objects on the left, um, which might give you some idea. But given there are 48 different dimensions left, um, I'm not sure that there, there's a particularly clear assignment of color to dimension. Um, yeah, that's probably something to do with the rose plot uh, algorithm, right? To yeah, probably you know make uh, neighboring the color distinct as possible or something like that. So it's nothing to do with their own invention, I think. As to the TSNE interpretation, uh, what Ariel you said is probably more or less fine. The only thing is that uh, you know uh, intuitive explanation is that uh, it uh, puts the uh, you know. Uh, data so that the neighborhood is uh, likely to be assigned in the same cluster or same set when you do the clustering of any kind. So that, you know, it's maximizing this, you know, uh, you know same cluster kind of, you know, uh, decision to be maximum. But underlying this is, uh, yeah, T distribution and so on. So, yeah, what you said is fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's a, this is an example of the dimensions that they pulled out, um, just demonstrating that the dimensions they pulled out are interpretable. Um, and this is an example of uh, how well the number of dimensions they used um, compared to uh, performance of the model at choosing the correct odd one out judgments. So there's two, there's two different elements here. So the left plot is looking at if they restrict the number of dimensions that the model had, um, is it still able to accurately perform these odd one out judgments? Um, so the full model has 49 dimensions, but maybe we can get rid of a whole bunch of those and the model will still perform fine. Um, and you can see here on the left that performance stays at the 95 to 99% level until we drop down to, let's say, below six dimensions or so. So it's just saying that um, at least with these 2,000 objects, you can accurately predict which object will be picked as the odd one out um, by only using six different dimensions, which would suggest that the, um, the number of dimensions humans use to make their similarity judgments is not actually necessarily that high. Um, whereas if instead of looking at correct prediction of the odd one out judgments, but just at the percentage of variance explained in the matrix, um, then it required uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 judgments. And I guess that applies to uh, Isaac's question from before about PCA. Um, so this is kind of then applying that PCA and um, seeing how many dimensions are required. Um, so the point being with both of these plots is that um, you don't actually need that many dimensions to explain the performance, um, at least with this domain of objects. Yeah, but, but you know, this comes back to my question, right? So if I have a particular set of this, you know, completely determined type of the object similarity judgment kind of rule, and uh, to explain that for me, maybe I need actually lots of dimensions, but uh, to, you know, sort of the gross over all of this, my peculiarity, and then trying to find some kind of commonality across, you know, like, you know, 5,000 people, then agreeable kind of dimension, maybe like six or 15 um, dimensions. That's also possible interpretation, right? Yeah, so it, that's an interesting point. And I guess what you'd have to do is you'd have to look at, if you did this with just individuals, mm. uh, what was the noise ceiling for individuals? So maybe the, the population noise level is, let's say like 65%, but maybe the individual noise level is like 90%. But to explain individual judgments, you need 100 dimensions or something. 
Um, mm. that, that's possible and uh, impossible to assess with this kind of analysis. Uh, yeah. This just talks about the intersubjective agreement level. Um, but can you then, just, you know, simply intuitively, it's kind of weird to explain all of our object perception in the sixth dimension, right? Don't you feel uh, like, you know, intuitively? I guess I, I think you could do pretty well. Like if I imagine it's like animate versus inanimate would be one, organic right. versus inorganic might be one, um, like big versus small might be one. I feel like we're getting a lot of that way. Conceptual versus abstract. I, I don't. I didn't actually check which the like were the dimensions that were the top six. Um, I could find that later. Mm. But uh, color wise, you know, you already have three dimension, right? Plus. And uh, yeah, you but know, you really need them. <laughs> I, don't I mean, know. colors are correlated. Like that's the thing, right? So this is why you can yeah, get away exactly. with like having a language right. that just does cool versus warm colors. Um, mm. So okay. But like in this one, you're only trying to measure the dissimilarity bit, right? Not the sort of finer features of the images. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Well, it's just it's just trying to predict these odd one out judgments. That's all it's doing. But that, that's like that's why it might be weirdly low in dimensions as opposed to something like far greater, which, you know, if you think that viewer perception is well explained in like 100 dimensions, then this sort of like the methodology wouldn't quite capture that just because it's odd one out. Um, is that, I don't know, is that right, but. Mm. Uh, I would think so, yeah. It's a much coarser question to just ask like which of these is the odd one out as opposed to can you fully describe your subjective experience or your subjective experience of this object? Um, but I guess just one last point on the, the model performance uh, and that also relates to Chianchin's question from before. They did one last thing to try and validate their model um, which is they re-ran the experiments on 20 random objects, but this time, instead of asking participants to do triad judgments, um, what they did was they just asked participants to rate the, um, the stimuli um, along the dimensions that they pulled out. Um, and the way they did that is they gave uh, samples of the objects at each end of the dimension. So you can see for this example, uh, one possible dimension has like tools or like hard objects at the high end and like the least tool like, which I guess is organic items on the uh, the low end of this dimension. And then they'd show a participants an item like this flamingo, for example, and they'd say like, where along this dimension does the flamingo go? Um, and presumably people would choose like the low or not at all end for this. Um, and then by using this procedure, they saw whether the um, matrix that they got uh, ended up matching the, um, the predicted matrix from the, the representational embedding they did before. And again, the, the model performs quite well. Um, just kind of an interesting validation method, but it doesn't really add any more to what they did previously. Um, so finally, uh, I just thought I'd bring this back to our lab specifically, rather than more generally in psychology. Um, what, I, what I found interesting about this in general and why I enjoyed it um, is it's just, it's really nice to see people try and make like an explicit model of human subjective similarity judgments. Um, and I liked the fact that it forces us to like actually make all of these assumptions and check whether these assumptions are true and see how well we can go at actually predicting human similarity judgments. Um, despite the fact that it's not obvious to me, and I guess now has been pointing this out throughout the, the um, talk, that it would be possible to get a model like this to accurately predict human subjective similarity judgments. Um, and as part of that, it's not obvious that you could get this model to work on the individual level as opposed to the group population level. Um, maybe it'll work for one, but not the other or vice versa. Um, sorry, I, I sort of lost my thread. Uh, what else was I gonna say? Um, yeah, it's also not a priori obvious as other people have pointed out um, that you could even use a representational embedding like this or a vector space like this to predict human similarity judgments. Um, for example, it might have been the case that people just really like features and they look for features in objects and then they, they don't add them together or subtract them together in a 
a simple sort of way like this sort of model predicts with continuous dimensions. Um, and yeah, I think that's essentially the points. We've actually discussed quite a few of these points already during the talk. Um, so I guess that concludes the material that I had prepared ahead of time for this. It's interesting that when I initially looked at the paper, it looked like very complicated to me. Um, but as I went through it, it actually turned out that I think it's, it's a reasonably simple way of trying to model human similarity judgments that still ends up being quite interesting. Um, so I guess at the end, I, I'm curious as to whether people thought that their approach was interesting or whether it's useful or actually provides insight into anything we might want to do. Um, the last point I'll make on that is the reason why I was interested specifically in the paper overall um, is I was interested as to whether the approach that they use in this paper is the same sort of approach that we could take in the lab to, for example, try and generate models of um, color space or sound space or any other qualia space we might be interested in exploring. All right, I'll leave it there. Great, thanks for that. That was um, super interesting. Uh, I guess I'll first ask a question. Yeah, I was wondering, so it's a really interesting method, but I was wondering, because obviously we both um, are researching color, if you think that this actually could be applied to color similarity, because I just can't think of, yeah, as we've also been speaking through the talk, all, what all these dimensions would be for color when we have our sim simple just color stimuli if we could use this model? Uh, I mean, I think it could definitely be applied to color. So if, if the assumptions of color being a metric space hold, which some papers say yes and some papers say no, um, but let's say that, uh, yeah, the symmetry applies and minimality applies and triangle inequality violations don't exist, um, then you could do exactly the same thing. You could like present uh, color stimuli to a bunch of participants. You could ask them to choose the odd one out, or you could use another similarity judgment procedure. Um, you could start with a model that had a whole bunch of different dimensions, and then you could just reduce it down. Um, and I guess most people would predict that probably you'd end up with a three-dimensional model where the right. remaining dimensions would be red to green, blue to yellow, and black to white, like the traditional model of color space. Um, Although maybe you'd find something else if you actually tried doing this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I definitely think it can be applied. Uh, yeah, just quickly, okay. ha have you have you encountered any color patch uh, try uh, old one out kind of paper? Uh, I'm almost certainly sure I have. Yes, um, but I would have to look through and check which ones they are. But yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure I have. Yeah, and also um, just quickly, the advantage of this odd, odd one out compared to the similarity is that uh, probably it's easier to train and instruct people uh, with you know no verbal capability, right? Like you know, kids or babies can be first trained on the obviously you know odd one, and then gradually closer to you know some kind of three trike uh, color patch and so on, and that can be done also for animals. Similarity yeah. rating is very difficult to probably train, right? For those yeah. people, yeah, and animal. So that, that's a huge advantage. Um, I can see, okay. Angus and Yoda have questions. Oh, sorry, I should let the chair do the chair's job. <laughs> that's okay. Um, Angus, would you like to ask your question? Yes, yeah, so I think I've, Two questions. Um, so, so the first one is on slide nine. Um, you show that they they check the validity of their method um, by applying it to an object set where they have all the um, similarity on one ratings, and then they get uh, this model fit of 0.9. But I was wondering if they also tried. Um, then trying to train a model on, on only a subset of these full ratings and then seeing how, how well the model still performs. 
Um, I think they do. I think the supplementary methods detail. Um, yeah, I think they, they use a restricted set. I think that there's a traditional like machine learning curve for like using um, subsets that's like 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 samples. And you can see the like curve improving. I can't remember how many, um, uh, I can't remember exactly what the curve looks like. Although actually, now that I say that, I'm not sure I understand your question. Was your question like, can you use a subset of the similarity judgments to still produce an accurate model? Or yeah, because yeah, like this whole this whole project is sort of, they have uh, over a billion um, comparisons that they need to make. And out of these, they only did a million or so. But their control validation sort of thing is testing, is not really testing what happens when you only use a small subset of the full kind of set of ratings that you could have. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain one of the extended figures uh, did that, which I will try and find as we I take your second question. Okay, uh, and then the second question is unrelated, uh, but so if I understand correctly... Actually, sorry, um, before you go on, I, here's the yeah. curve. So if you wanted to see, that's how the performance increases as they increase the training size. Uh, so with 100,000 trials, it's doing 59% by... 500,000 trials, it's doing 62% or so. Um, you can see it I, I was, off. I was, I was thinking more like if you have, um, so say your similarity matrix um, can have 1 million different distances and then you only have 100 of those versus having um, 900. All oh, right. Um, yeah. Cause, cause, yeah. You you said earlier they have like over a billion different um, ratings that you can have, or pairings or whatever. Um, but then they only did one million or so. They only obtained one million or so of these, and then from that they construct the model. Yeah. So the so yeah, I wanted to see if they actually tested the validity of doing that. Um, when you have very few of um, the ratings that you can actually use. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I'm not sure if they did that. I'd have to look through the extended figures again. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, yeah, j just to understand what, what you're saying, Angus. So you're saying that the, what you wanted to see is that the, based on 0.1% of the try at odd one out uh, yeah. performance, yeah. You yeah. want to recover 100% of the, you know, billion entry of the, the triad uh, uh, response, and then see whether that one, you know, unfilled part of this, you know, triad uh, thing corresponds to the predicted or not. Something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. 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 I, I don't know whether based on 0.1%, whether they can actually predict a full billion triad matrix. But uh, because this is a generative model, it shouldn't be possible to do that, I think. So yeah, good point. I, I yeah, mean, I suspect it would work. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I was expecting that you were going to show with this um, sort of, with this slide in that they have their, their you have 100% um, of your triads. And then if you only take like, one percent of those and then try to build a model do you can you recover the the 100 percent matrix because that that seems to be the crux of what they're trying to do mm. well they're they're trying to predict the um yeah i mean i, I guess that is in a sense what they are hold on maybe i'm confused again maybe i, I haven't understood something so they're trying to predict which item is the odd one out, which is essentially they're trying to be able to predict uh, which one will be the odd one out in all million of those comparisons. Um, so they're trying to generate the representational dissimilarity matrix for all 
eight, like 1,854 objects against the 1,854 objects. And then what they're going to do for like any particular triad is they're just going to pick like the three like values that correspond to um, the similarity between each of those two, each of those three objects. Um, so each of those is pairwise, and then they'll just see which one has like the lowest or the highest value. Um, I, I, so I guess I'm unclear on how what they've done isn't what you're asking for. Probably there, there is one thing just I, I wanted to add to uh, what the Angus said. But the, Angus, you said that the, the crux of what they wanted to do was to sort of like interpret or extrapolate, you know, hundred uh, percent odd one out, right? But the, I I don't think that's the that's true. So what they wanted to do is to reveal the structure of the object perception. That, that is the goal, right? And then to do that, it is, you know, odd one out is one way of doing it. But odd one out to do this, all the single combination is infeasible, like a huge space. So they only did that, you know, or something 10.1%. But they, they are crux of the things is that, you know, even with that, they can get to this object, you know, representation. So, uh, okay. so maybe I, maybe, mm. yeah, maybe I misunderstood something, but uh, so basically they want to get this similarity matrix mm. at the end, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. And then they want to do it uh you can you can do it by getting all the similarity ratings or odd one out pairings um or you can try doing it without getting all of them you can try doing it with only a subset mm -hmm. and what i wanted to see like empirically is um here they have a 48 um, matrix and they have all the odd one um ratings odd one out ratings and then they 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 then use all the all those ratings to build the model. Is that right or wrong? I, I think this uh, matrix yeah. is uh, predicted and also major similarity, not the odd one out performance. Uh, well, it, right. it, those amount to the same thing. So maybe I'll, I'll just run through again and we'll make sure we're on the same page. So they they have generated this. Uh, my computer's being laggy. So they, they've like ended with this model, like the best specified version of this model that's the most up-to-date after all of their training. Um, and then they pick out 48 rows from this, which correspond to 48 objects. Um, and then using that, they generate one of these representational dissimilarity matrices, um, but from the like smallest, uh, from a subset of those. So only those 48, um, which, will amount to back on this slide uh this one under it so this left hand matrix here um, and then using this matrix you can predict which item will be selected as the odd one out by taking any three values and then just seeing which value is the like largest value out of those three um, and then they are also looking at the actual measured similarity where they fully measured it for those 48 objects um, uh, um, with like actual subjective participant data. Um, so. Wait, wait, just to make sure, okay. So I thought this in a major of the similarity is the similarity rating task, which is a separate experiment, what they did using only 48 uh, now objects, but you know, they tested all the pairs of the 48 objects, right? I think it's with triads again. I think when they say similarity, they mean um, the, uh, like they're deriving that from like which object is likely to be selected as the odd one out or not, whether they're likely but, to be. But you, you say below yeah, in your note, you know, 48 objects matrix fully sampled with human participants. Yeah. And I, I, I think that was the case. So I think in the, this one is a major similarity, literary. Two objects at the time. I will pull up the paper. Sorry, if other people have questions in the meantime, they can ask. Uh, 
maybe we can actually, you know, if you if you are not that comfortable, you know, we can cut that part out. out oh, I mean, people can see. We, yeah. <laughs> how lab meetings work if they want. I'm but yeah, that, that's actually good, actually, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. that, that's how it works, yeah. Where did it go? Although, maybe I'll have to find it later because I might be yeah, looking through the that, that's machine. fine, yeah. <laughs> okay, my apologies to viewers and to Angus. Uh, I'll find this later. <laughs> but that, did it answer all of your questions, Angus? Um, maybe if I can just ask a quick clarifying question. Um, so did they apply their method twice, one to this um, really big data set where they only had a subset of the, a very small subset of the odd one outs and a control subset where they, where they had all the odd one out ratings? Or did they apply it only once and then for the 48 subset, um, that's part of the first application and they just pulled that out? Yeah, the latter one. So they just okay. pulled it out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Yoda, do you have a question? Uh, yes. And my question was uh, related to Angus' first question. And I think Nell's comment un somehow answered my question. But the point of this paper is uh, kind of saying that um, you can reconstruct some dimension based on limited um, information from similarity or one out uh, output. But my question was, let's say in figure uh, or slide seven, um, you show a um, vector representation for each object, i, j, k, for different object, let's say or automat. So is it possible to um get this um, vector for unseen object um so let me check if i understand that so if you have an unseen object um, okay. is it possible to get the like is it is it possible to get the value like the vector corresponding to the values along the different dimensions for the unseen object? Yes. Um, I'm not sure how you would obtain that for this sort of model. Like, do you mean through running some sort of like image recognition analysis over the image? Or I, I guess I'm not conceptually clear on how you would get the values for the dimensions for an unseen object, unless I've misunderstood your question. Uh, so, so I, I think my confusion comes from the prediction, the predicted matrix. Uh, when the predicted matrix, or what, so when you say predicted matrix, it's a predicted uh, from fixed object image set, not unseen. Yes. Right. Okay, then, yeah, that's fine because when I you know, see that word predicted, kind of, you know, I understood that means that you can predict something for unseen object or something. Uh, okay, I think I understand your question now. So it's a, it's a matter of confusion as to what prediction and unseen means. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there's 1854 objects. Um, but the similarity judgments between all of those objects are not fully sampled. So when they say predicted, they mean they're correctly able to estimate which one out, out of three objects will be chosen as the odd one out when they don't actually have any empirical data to select that. Um, but they're not saying that if you throw new objects in, that they'll be able to predict which one is the odd one out um, because this model has no way of assigning dimension values to new objects that are put in. Um, Although they would say that if you could assign dimension values to new objects that were put in, so let's say you ran image analysis and you could see that an object looked like it was a hammer or something, then you'd be able to like then predict the similarity judgments for that. But that's not what they do in this paper. Okay, yeah. Um, and then to jump back to Angus's question from before, because we've only got a few minutes left. So they said, uh, we used online crowdsourcing to collect two or three behavioral responses for each possible triplet. 
and calculated the choice probabilities for each pair of objects as a measure of their similarity. So that's how they're doing similarity, not through directly collecting like how similar are these two objects. Um, they're just saying which one gets chosen as, actually, I guess that's not clear exactly what that means. They don't, maybe, maybe they make it clear in the supplementary information. Sorry, I thought I'd clarified the point, but maybe I haven't. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Just uh, one comment. I think you're muted uh, now. Uh, I just said that uh, uh, I quickly looked uh, at the method, but uh, it, it wasn't super clear that, so that uh, we can actually decode it super clearly right now. So maybe it's embedded in the supplementary material. Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, something occurred to me. I don't know if they did this, probably not, but it would be nice to, I mean, uh, assuming the model is, is uh, valid and uh after settling with some number of dimensions it would be nice to go and explore whether there are regions of the space that are more uh more or less sparse so perhaps the natural objects whether they are animals or, or whatever normal objects they fall into only certain region of space and uh, in some sense, you you could try to like explore those regions that are unlikely to have objects in them, and uh, <laughs> maybe some weird synthetic stuff could come from there as a sort of a generative model for uh, strange stimuli or something. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I was also going to suggest that, in fact. So, like, you know, now that we have a generative model, you can actually parameterize, like, uh, like insect like food or something that is usually incompatible with our imagination, right? Like, you know, circular, I don't know, square or whatever. <laughs> and then uh, with that, if we can actually generate this kind of object, that would be interesting. But, you know, remember that this is not uh, generative in terms of the image, right? Yeah, just predictions. <laughs> yeah, predictions about the behavior. So, yeah. you know, we can't use that kind of uh, purpose. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think with respect to Angus and the Yota's uh, comments, I think uh, what Ariel explained as a sort of algorithm, you know, what they did is probably the most uh, important kind of, uh, or a key point to understand this paper probably. What they wanted to do eventually is not to fill in all the empirically determined uh, similarity matrix, although they could probably do that uh, in principle, but what they want to achieve is this, you know, estimate of this 90 by 100, uh, 1800 object uh, feature matrix, right? And once they have that, they claim that they can actually make a prediction about the similarity and also make a prediction about all the one out. And also, you know, understand that what the object is like according to this 90 dimension or 48 dimensions of this, you know, thing. So, yeah, I mean, and then, yeah. Yeah, just to finish. And then to do that, what they did was this, you know, circle of this, you know, iterative uh, process of starting from some kind of estimation. And then based on the actual results for one particular point of the comparison, and then they adjust it, adjust it, adjust it, adjust it, as long as you, they have a many, many more data. So for that purpose, they don't need a uh, you know, huge amount of the, you know, measurement and also, uh, the validating that one with respect to the empirical video is not their purpose, right? In that respect. Assuming that, you know, this 1800 by uh, 48 is the dimension 
or the representation of the object they think. I think that, that that's my take. Go ahead, Ariel. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm pretty sure like, given the title is revealing the multidimensional mental representations of natural objects, um, that what they really wanted was just to have a good idea of what those dimensions were, because that's what they spend most of their results in discussion discussing. They actually, they, they go in and they talk about like whether those, the dimensions are like typical and whether you can find typical objects for those dimensions and those sorts of things. So there's quite a lot of focus on um, how good those dimensions are and like how they map to preconceived categories of objects that people might have that I didn't even get into because it's not what I was interested in exploring. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're right on five. So uh, thanks again for that really good presentation. Uh, and we'll end the meeting here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Do you want to keep everything and then upload, or do you want to cut that uh, apart? That's fine. I don't mind. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed.